It's the magical alien MacGuffin driving the mystery of the show. Let's do the science of the expanse's protomolecule. The protomolecule is really the great big bad of the expanse. It's sort of like the White Walkers of Game of Thrones. It's the looming threat that is really something people should be paying attention to when in fact they're really just involved in these petty squabbles between one another. And while doing the science on the protomolecule maybe is a bit ambitious, we don't understand enough about it, I think there is something we can begin to project a little bit about it based on what we know and what we've seen so far. The authors have said that the protomolecule has limited limitations. They're not sharing that with the audience, but they do have firmly in their mind some limitations about how the protomolecule operates. And even if that isn't apparent to us right away as viewers of the show, so let's just start with what we know about the protomolecule so far. So what we know is that it came to our solar system about 2 billion years ago, that it seemed to be launched from outside the solar system by an alien civilization, and that it was sent to sort of an autonomous probe, or at least an autonomous machine, into the solar system for some unknown reason. Now, the general assumption that it was a sent towards Earth, which would have at that time only had sort of basic microbial life just beginning. And theories have ranged on everything of it being some sort of weapon to it being a terraforming platform of some kind to something else. And although it becomes apparent later on in the books more of what it is, I, I don't want to get into that now because one, I don't want to spoil the future episodes. But really, we don't know that the show is going to go in the same direction as the book. So it might change something up. So there's no point in me bringing in too many books ahead of information. So let's just stick to what we know from the show. So from the, again, from the theories, mostly they revolve around it being either a weapon to wipe out early life on Earth or it's some sort of terraforming platform. And honestly, the wiping out the weapon theory never made much sense to me. What reason would uh, sort of uh, aliens have to wipe out microbial life? Some people say that, well, it could evolve into something, but that just seems unlikely and sort of a big reach. But that's kind of irrelevant because at the end of the day, they're all speculation. We really don't know. So as we said, it was sent to the solar system at some point about 2 billion years ago, or at least entered the solar system system two billion years ago. We don't know when it was actually launched. It was captured by the gravity of Saturn, we think mistakenly, and uh, ended up uh, orbiting Saturn and became the moon, the moon that we call Phoebe. Now, Phoebe, in real life, it's about 210, it's, it's irregularly shaped, actually, but it's a, on average about 210 kilometers in diameter. Uh, so that puts it about 10 times the size of Eros and maybe about one fifth the size of Ceres. So it's, a, it's, it's not a small object where to hit the Earth, it would cause all kinds of problems. But as far as a moon goes, it's a fairly small moon. Now, assuming that it accumulated additional material over uh, over the time that it was in orbit around Saturn, we can still assert that probably most of that body was protomolecule. We also know that it assimilates or takes over organic material and living beings. Uh, for some reason, that's really kind of unclear. And that it uses it also uses inorganic matter as well to sort of build structures. So what it's actually doing and why it can infect a living multicellular organisms when it was launched at a planet that only had sort of single cell life at a time, that actually is not quite clear to me. But uh, certainly it can co-opt and adapt to, to a sort of more complex organic life. Those are sort of the things we know about it. There's a bunch of other things we know about its ability to sort of use energy in certain ways and affect inertia but I'll get I'll get into that a little bit later in turn when I get to the part where I talk about its magical abilities but that's what we kind of know so taking those facts we can begin to speculate a little bit about what it's about and what the protomolecule is capable of and maybe how it's formed and that's actually a good point in the show for me to say this whole episode is a one gigantic my theory so you know in previous shows I'd love to use the hashtag my theory for you giving me a theory on what you think is going on in different parts of the show this is almost entirely speculation and reasoning. So just use the hashtag my theory if you'd like and give me your thoughts on any of this and what you think the proto molecule is, what your speculation, how it's formed, what its intentions are and how it operates. I'd love to hear that. I think it can make for some great uh, sort of dialogue and discussion in the comments. So leave those down in the comments below. I would really love to hear what you think and I think the rest of the community would too. All right, so getting back to sort of the composition of what it seems to do. It seems to be some sort of set of instructions or artificial intelligence and it also seems to have a mechanical component that can interact, interact with its surroundings and it stores information as well. So I think the composition of it, let me talk about that for a moment, what I think it must be composed of. First, it has some sort of AI component. It's described somewhere in the series, I know at least in the books, I think in the series as well, as sort of a free floating set of instructions. Now, free free floating is sort of nonsensical. That doesn't mean anything. But what I, what I think you can say is there's, there's probably a compute component. There's an assembly component. There's a sort of a structure component, maybe an uh, information storage 
component and then there's a power component. So let's talk about the sort of compute component. It obviously is an AI of some kind. It seems to have some quantum com computing capability. Now, what that means is sort of wide open. We tend to talk about photonic computing when we say quantum computing, but there are very advanced theories of computing that we could take actually quantum com quantum particles in existing matter and turn them into a sort of a compute platform. And so that for if anyone of you are not familiar with sort of a particle physics, what that means is that at the very top level, we're all comprised of these sort of cells that are made up of molecules, which are these large grouping of atoms that have different properties that allow them to aggregate. Below the molecule level, there's sort of this, this thing of the atom which are not quite fundamental particles but they're very they're sort of um they're composed of neutrons protons and electrons generally and they they form sort of the basis for most of the things in the universe below that however components of an atom most of the proton and the neutron are also composed of what's called quarks which are very small subatomic particles that are when you get into quantum mechanics those and electrons and photons they compose sort of these very fundamental pro uh, particles and they're a very advanced theoretical um concept for computing in the in the possible future that have all sorts of magical components that could that say maybe it's possible at some day to exploit charge or spin or some other factor of fundamental quantum particles in a way that doesn't alter its interaction with matter so that we could turn any matter in the universe into a compute platform. And I would actually assert that I think that's probably going on with the protomolecule, that its compute and its reasoning is somehow embedded in sort of the quarks or some quantum component of the universe that doesn't require the greater structure or the organic matter. So the instructions sort of stay packaged up in these quantum things, which are un undisturbable. At least they can't be easily disturbed in a way that destroys the instruction. The second part is some sort of nanotechnology that serves as the assembly platform. So that's where you see it absorbing inorganic or organic material that becomes sort of the act, the, the mechanical device of the AI pla compute platform. It's uh, fundamental nanoparticles. Their, their first order business would be basically to uh, assemble more nanoparticles, which is what the uh, protomolecule seem to be doing. So it's making rep replicating itself, making more of these bodies, all directed by sort of the quantum computing platform. And then there's some other elements about uh, inorganic matter, crystalline structures that form either some structural component. I would assert that there's a good chance that maybe these are information storage platforms as well. I won't get into it too much, but crystals have a lot of sort of uh, potential for sort of new information storage platforms in the future because they're multidimensional. You can you can exploit sort of the properties of individual crystals at different angles uh, to, to sort of store information. And I think that that's likely to be the case with the a AI as well. And then lastly, sort of this, this power um, power component of it that we know, uh, maybe the crystals, by the way, are also used for storage of power, but we know that it generally powers itself in a mechanism which sort of seems sort of analogous to photosynthesis, but instead of photonic light, it absorbs and utilizes ionic radiation to some degree, which isn't impossible. Uh, most of the reason why plants can't do that is because ionic ra ionizing radiation is very damaging to DNA, and so the fundamental structure of our bodies can't handle that, so there's no usefulness for us being able to, to sort of use that as energy. Uh, however, if this protomolecule isn't damaged by it, certainly that's a, a, a viable source of power. Uh, so it has some sort of structure that enables it to do that. So turning back to the AI a second, again, I think the basis of the AI is probably some sort of quantum element uh, that gives the advantage that if the greater structures and the nanomaterials of the, of the protomolecule are destroyed, that the instructions themselves stay intact. I do think that the show is making an interesting commentary. I don't know if it's intentional or not, but it's making an interesting commentary on the sort of the future capabilities of AI. Nothing in the show indicates that the protomolecule is self-conscious. It's just simply an artificial intelligence that's able to carry out maybe very complex sets of instructions and have a sort of contextual understanding of its surroundings, but there's nothing that indicates that it's a full-on consciousness. Uh, and of course, we see the computers in, on the Rosinante and in the in the expanse itself that humans have. They certainly aren't capable of consciousness. They have some sort of art, artif artificial intelligence, a little bit amped up from what we see on sort of uh, Siri or, or Amazon Echo right now, but really not much more. So it's making the statement, at least to me, that consciousness, artificial artificial consciousness is either not possible or well beyond the technology of all of these uh, individuals, with these, including the aliens that we're seeing in the show. Consciousness being sort of the adaptive self-aware ability to sort of change and add to your knowledge base and interact with the universe in a very specific sort of self-centered kind of way, as opposed to intelligence, which means the ability to contextualize, understand, maybe reason through things, but it's not as quite as adaptive as, as consciousness. There are actually loose definitions, but there is a definite difference.
So theories of what kind of develops consciousness in individuals, there are two predominant theories, although there's a number, there's two major wide sort of ranging theories that either consciousness is emergent or that it's an inherent property of matter. So um, let me go through the emergent thing because the expanse essentially disproves that. What the emergence theory is, is that given enough uh, overlapping sort of algorithms and equations that consciousness emerges from sort of the interaction of those algorithms together in some sort of balanced, hopefully balanced way that produces consciousness in a living thing. Now, if that's true, then it's just a matter of time before we create computers with sophisticated enough algorithms to become conscious on their own. The other prominent theory is, and this is a bit more out there, and actually I have to, I, I don't want to disregard it just because it's hard for me to, to wrap my head around, but it certainly seems to have some serious thought behind it. That consciousness is an inherent property of matter. There might even be a state of matter. Now, in this case, there's some esoteric reasoning for what might impart consciousness on, onto matter as a property, sort of as a state of it. But um, that basically either happens or it does not happen. And in the case of the expanse, I think it's at least implying that there are no algorithms that can be chained together that forms consciousness. So consciousness is not emergent in the, in the universe of the expanse. Instead, it must be some inherent property of matter that cannot be replicated simply by creating an intelligent machine. I, I thought that was somewhat interesting. Again, I don't know if it's intentional by, on the part of the showrunners, but I thought it was an interesting statement made by in a literary sense. Now, another interesting component of the AI of the Prada Molecule is that somehow it seems to use the thoughts of the people that it infects as sort of a template for its decision-making matrix. Now, that you see that with Julie Mao in The Expanse, where that uh, sort of uses her reasoning as a basis for its striving intelligence. You also see it in the case of the protomolecule warriors, they at least use some of the basic instincts of the children that they were based on to drive them as warriors. So there's obviously some sort of reasoning there and it's a mixture of the two. This is an entirely guess theory on my part, but I would actually say that that is probably due to sort of a self repair mechanism inherent in the protomolecule. If we go back to what I said earlier about Phoebe was mostly protomolecule, then the little bit that made its way to Eero Station, that's a very minute fractional part of the original machine. So it's actually somewhat reasonable in my guess to say that the protomolecule was in recovery mode, that there was a very small bit of it that was maybe base level code that came across in the sort of the quantum particles of it. And it's trying to reestablish enough of itself and enough of its logic to become active again for whatever its mission is. And then maybe to do that, it begins to ma map uh, intelligence that it sees around it or patterns that it sees around it. And perhaps that's why it does it with humans. How it knows to do that with human beings actually I have a theory on that, but I'm going to I'm going to save that for a future episode if it pans out like the books does. But I'm not going to cover that now. But let's just say it's a mystery as to why it does right now adapt to humans. But maybe there's some commonality there that can do it. But I think that that's an indicator that it's really in recovery mode, that it doesn't not enough of it has survived to take on its full mission. So it's looking to sort of build enough of a base of an AI to start again. Now, the show really shows a lot of fantastic properties of the protomolecule that don't immediately make sense to us, but it's not supposed to. It's one of the interesting things of the show. Actually, I think that they take the solar system, the expanse, and you could see humankind in a few hundred years, and they've got technology that is advanced, and it requires sort of big leaps in some cases, and even in some other cases, sort of really magical things like the Epstein Drive is fairly magical by our standard. It's still, we can, we can map a path from where we are now to where the expanse is in the future, and it's one of the sort of the, the anchoring parts of the show for us is something that we really, at least as a viewer, I love it. And I think a lot of people who watch the show love it too. But that really enhances sort of the, the stakes with the protomolecule even further because we can see advanced technology by our standards reflected in the people of the expanse. But then you bring the protomolecule in. And against that, this absolutely makes these uh, the, the ships that you know, humans are flying around in seem like sort of child's toys. And that harkens back to sort of an Arthur C. Clarke quote, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And that's what we have here with the protomolecule. It's a sort of a fantastic MacGuffin that drives the plot forward, as I said at the opening of the show, but it gives us enough of a glimpse to make it very interesting for us to carry on as a thought experiment. We have seen it do a few things, though, that I think are, are sort of interesting to, to explore because it sets realities in the universe. First, we know that it's either able to warp space or negate inertia in some ways. We saw that with Eros when it moves Eros and then sends it flying towards Venus at the beginning of the second season. 
But we also know that the crew of the Rosinante, when they did that, said that Eros itself heated up. So it didn't seem to be sort of violating the laws of ther thermodynamics. So while it's magical, still the protomolecule is very firmly sort of rooted in science. And no, we know it doesn't depart from it. It's not actually magic. We just know that we just don't understand it. We also know it has some kind of control over gravity or magnetism of some kind. When we saw the protomolecule warrior walking around in the Rosinante during the end of the second season, one of the interesting things is they cut the reactors off so that it wouldn't be attracted to the radiation, but it still walked around attached to the decking as normal. So either it had some sort of magnetic connection to it or it was able to produce its own gravity. I have no idea, but it, it, it was able to walk around normally. One of the really interesting things to me is when, it, when uh, acceleration was cut, so everything should have been in free fall, it still used the ladder to get up to the next level that Holden was on. So that was actually just kind of blew me away and uh, was very interesting. And I have no way to answer what was going on there. And we also know from what it did to the Arbogast at the end of the second season that it has some ability to control matter in some advanced way. I don't know if it's, kin it's kinetic energy or it can manipulate it in space, but certainly it can move objects at will through some ability that it has. So these are very, very fantastic abilities that we will never understand. But obviously, sort of, it has a very strong control over the basic sort of uh, Newtonian physics and sort of, sort of thermodynamic physics uh, that we're all used to in our universe. So there's a lot here to unpack. This has probably been one of the longest shows I've had, much longer than I ever intended for these shows to go. I intend them for be about 10 minutes or so. So thanks for hanging in there if you come this far in the show. Again, I would love to hear your theories on a lot of this. There's a lot to unpack about the proto molecule. How do you think its AI runs? How do you think it's able to self-assemble? What do you think its basic properties are? I would love to hear your thoughts. So use the hashtag my theory and uh, let us know what your thoughts on how the proto molecule operates. If you thought you heard something that you hadn't thought about before, I'd love to hear that. If you got something to add, please go ahead and do that. I would love to hear your thoughts in the comment. So the, the sky is the limit in terms of comments here because there's nothing that we can really say truthfully about the protomolecule one way or another. That's it for this week's episode. If you enjoyed it, it would help me a lot if you please click the like button below. If you want to catch future episodes, be sure to click the subscribe button and for notifications, click the bell icon next to subscribe to get pop-ups when I post a new show each week. If you think your friends might enjoy the show, please click the share button to tell them about it on Facebook and Twitter. As always, I'd love to hear your comments on what you heard today, what you enjoyed, if we left something out, or you had something to add. If you've gotten this far, use the hashtag protomolecule, and I know you've gotten all the way to the end. You can also follow me on Twitter at Streamweaver and leave a comment there. Thanks for joining me. I look forward to your theories this week, and as always, stay curious.